So I'm Hugh Taylor. I'm the chair of obstetrics and gynecology at the Yale School of Medicine. I'm also serving as president of the American Society for Reproductive Medicine this year. And I know that you've been concerned about this issue for some time. Would you take a moment and tell us uh, the study that you published in Scientific Reports? Again, being an obstetrician gynecologist, I'm particularly interested in the effects on development. That's a very vulnerable time when organ systems are just forming. Uh, that's probably the time when we're most susceptible to lots of different insults and damage. So we wanted to know if radiation from a cell phone could be harmful to a developing fetus, to the uh, baby while still in the, in the mother's womb. Um, so we exposed um, mice during pregnancy uh, to a cell phone. And as a control group, uh, we used a cell phone that was uh, not connected, so not broadcasting, not sig sending out a signal to the tower, so not emitting that radiation. So we had two groups, those that were exposed, cell phone um, on the top of the mouse cage versus a control group with an inactive, non-broadcasting cell phone. Um, and then we waited till the pups were born, they were no longer exposed to a cell phone after they were born. So this only looked at the effects of exposure during pregnancy, while they were in the womb, while they were still developing. And we found that these mice, after they growed up, still had residual damage from that cell phone exposure, that they uh, were more hyperactive, their memory was poor, um, yet uh, they didn't seem anxious about that. Uh, so they were again bouncing off the bouncing off the cage uh, without a care in the world, um, uh, much like you might think of as ADHD or some conditions that affect people. I'm not saying that mice had that condition because we don't diagnose that medical condition in a mouse, uh, but I think that's what it most closely modeled. Um, so I'm really worried about the effect of cell phone exposure, uh, radiation exposure to the fetus. Again, key developmental points are often our most vulnerable time, and the damage done to the fetus uh, is carried with that uh, baby after birth and into adulthood. Um, this is a very important time for us to be vigilant about. Now, you know that your study was among many thousands submitted to the Federal Communications Commission as part of the notice of inquiry. Uh, you and I briefed the FCC. We talked with researchers at the FCC about your study. And yet what the court has said here is that the FCC failed utterly to show any consideration of the evidence submitted to it about effects on pregnancy, effects on children, effects on sperm. And so I, we are hoping that the FCC now will have to take a new look and will consult with you on this issue. As aside from our presentations to them and submitting your studies, has anyone from the FCC ever called you to ask you about the relevance of your research? Not yet, uh, but I hope they do. I'd love to discuss it with them. Again, I think uh, we're very much about protecting those most vulnerable and those uh, early life exposures are the ones that have been less well studied and uh, where we think most of the damage is. So very important to consider those, take those into account, and I, I'm hopeful uh, that we'll do that moving forward. Do you have any other thoughts on this lawsuit yourself? Uh, you know, I think we can't wait for this to work through the courts and through uh, rethinking these uh, pro federal regulatory processes. I think we need to act now, and if I were a um, uh, someone considering pregnancy or someone who is pregnant or a mother of a young child, I think it's just important to move that cell phone away from you and not be exposed to that radiation any more than possible. Uh, you know, uh, uh, not that we would give up using a cell phone entirely, uh, but uh, certainly don't uh, leave it on constantly on your side or uh, near your abdomen uh, when you're pregnant. Just move it across the room. The radiation dissipates fairly quickly with distance from uh, your body. So just uh, moving it to the other side of the room is a wise idea when you're pregnant. Don't wait for this to be worked out uh, publicly. Take some precautions right now. There's, it's very easy to do, little downside to doing it, and you may just be protecting your, your baby or unborn child um, 
uh, from lifelong uh, damage. As, as you and I both know, um, lead is an example of a neurotoxin where when exposures occur very early, uh, whether, whether during pregnancy or in the first two years of life, it has a permanent effect on the capacity of the child who's exposed to lead to function later on in life. One of the things that I think is so fascinating that few people appreciate is that very early in human pregnancy, there's just a few cells at the tip of it that develop, that become the brain. And the brain grows spectacularly during pregnancy and continues to grow in the first two years of life. So what is so fascinating about your work is that you demonstrated behavioral effects of cell phone radiation. We've talked a little bit about the work of other researchers that have shown effects on the hippocampus uh, so that there's a physiological foundation uh, for, for what you've established. Because what they have shown is that prenatally exposed animals then subsequently develop literally smaller hippocampus. Have you been able to do any follow-up studies to these? Well, it's nice to see that a lot of the work that we've done has been confirmed in other ways, looking at other areas of the brain or other, other types of uh, outcomes. So it's nice to see the consensus there. And it's nice to see this confirmed in humans in the epidemiologic literature, where although you don't uh, intentionally expose humans to something harmful, there are plenty of now data that correlate high cell phone use with these types of conditions like ADHD in the children. Um, so uh, we have uh, done a little bit of follow-up of this, although it's not our main focus of research anymore, uh, but we did look at exposure to um, uh, newborns um, and found less of an effect. Uh, important that there was a dose responsive effect. So the lower amounts of cell phone exposure, the shorter duration, uh, the less damage that was done. So cutting back really can make a difference. Uh, but also the newborns uh, were less susceptible to this effect uh, than the fetus. So pregnancy is really the window that's most important to us. And that uh, has not been published yet, but our subsequent work on the newborn um, was uh, less dramatic than the fetus. So you're working with mice when you talk about newborns. Correct. But I would say, but I would say that with humans, we have something different because we know that babies have thinner skulls with more fluid in them. So in fact, babies, infants and toddlers many of whom are being given cell phones to calm them down, are in fact sub subject to great vulnerability, whether it's to lead or potentially cell phone radiation. So let me ask you uh, that, what do you see as a possibility for your organization now that you're the president to provide more advice um, with the Baby Safe Project and others, which you are a leader of? Uh, the Baby Safe Project has more than 300 physicians now who have signed on to say that we want to warn pregnant women and young parents of the need to protect their children from this exposure. And as you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends minimizing exposures, particularly to very young children and reducing screen time. This is really challenging given the pandemic situation that yeah. found so many young children in front of screens. So how do you see this, your organization moving ahead on this matter? Absolutely. Well, my organization in particular is more interested in pregnancy. We're, we're a fertility organization, so rather than a pediatric organization. But I would agree that there are certainly concerns for children as well. Um, and uh, I, I use the precautionary principle. If something is implicated as harmful, we need to study it more. And in the meantime, protect those who are at risk, protect the vulnerable from these exposures. And I would say to parents out there now, no matter what you may have done in the past, you can start to make sure that whenever you give a young child a device because you've just reached your wits end, put it on airplane mode, download what you want to the device first, recognize that when you give a child any of these devices, a phone or an iPad, they function as a two-way microwave radio. And what you wanna do is to minimize that exposure to the extent that, that you can. And the precautionary principle better safe than sorry, is what is driving the Baby Safe project. Couldn't have said it better myself. That is key that people understand that. It is that uh, uh, radiation coming from the phone when it is, or, or the other device when it is broadcasting and connected to um, uh, other devices. It's that broadcast signal that's projected out of the phone or, or other electronic device. It is not the device itself. So having on airplane mode where there's no 
radiation coming out of that phone trying to broadcast to a receiver is exactly the way it should be used whenever possible. With all the important work you're doing at Yale University and your work as an, in the profession of uh, reproductive biology, we thank you for your leadership and we hope that with this lawsuit, the world is going to be paying much more attention to the important work that you've done, to the Baby Safe Project, and to all of the efforts that we have to keep our children safe. If you think about it, we spend so much time with respect to uh, seat belts and airbags and baby special armor for them. They can't go anywhere without a whole armory of, of a, a devices. So the absence of this advice from the FCC is, is rather disappointing. And I really appreciate your leadership on this issue and taking the time from your very busy schedule to talk with us. And Deborah, thank you for all you're doing and your work. It's really quite amazing. Probably the most important thing I did, I was involved as a young scientist in the committee that actually reviewed the data and recommended that there be no smoking on airplanes. You may be shocked to hear that it was even a question for science at the time, but it was. And when I look at what we know now about mobile phone radiation, I see some very interesting similarities. A growing number of prominent doctors and scientists are raising warning flags over radiation this morning, and your kids could be facing a greater risk of exposure. I think the most important study is a study by the National Toxicology Program. In a classic, large carcinogenicity test, one of the largest ever performed, and for that matter, one of the most expensive, they found increased risk of the tumours, which we believe radiofrequency radiation is causing in man. Uh, particular tumours called schwannomas, in the rats they were in the heart, in, in humans, they're often in the nerve, the ear nerve, the vestibular nerve. Cell phone providers say they follow all safety guidelines put into place by the FCC. The current FCC safety standard was developed nearly 20 years ago. The, the manufacturers actually tell people in the instruction manual, which I never read, to put, not to put the cell phone against your ear. It does say exactly that. There's a, the BlackBerry, for example, warns to keep your phone at least 0.98 inches away from the body when transmitting. With, uh, with an iPhone, for example, it's 5 eighths of an inch. At this point, the evidence has become sufficiently strong that cell phone radiation is a human carcinogen. A major development from California's Department of Public Health, high use of cell phones may be linked to certain types of cancer and other health effects, including brain cancer and tumors, lower sperm counts, headaches, and effects on learning, memory, hearing, behavior, and sleep. If it was a real problem, I would know. If it was a real problem, the government would protect us. How come I'm not hearing about this? They're all things I've heard when I give seminars. You know, I get up there and they say, oh yeah, if this was really a problem, they would have told us. I am they. I am a, you know, legitimate scientist and I am telling you. That cell phone, the one in your pocket, emits radio frequency radiation. As long as your phone's turned on, even if you're not talking or texting. The American Academy of Pediatrics in over a dozen countries recommends reducing children's exposure to wireless radiation. When using a cell phone, I always keep it away from my body. I use speakerphone or a headset like this. To stop microwave exposure, I put my phone on airplane mode and turn off Wi-Fi and Bluetooth function. I hold the phone at a distance and make sure it's not touching my body. Cell phones are not toys. Children's brains and bodies are still developing and are vulnerable to wireless radiation. Practice safe and responsible habits with yourself and your children. When using the computer, I always try to make sure my connection is corded, not wireless. Remember not to use your cell phone in the car. The phone works at higher power in metal surroundings and bounces around, increasing your family's radiation exposure. For their safety. For your safety. Because children are more vulnerable. Remind them. Remind yourself. To limit your microwave radiation exposures.